built-in assumption? Doesn't their question assume that evolution happened? I would say, teacher, this question is poorly written. It assumes evolution has happened when it has not. It's like asking the question, you know, why are elephants orange? You know, that's a good question. Why are they orange anyway? I don't know. <laughs> They're not. Hello. <laughs> and this question is not designed to make the students think critically. Do you think humans are still evolving? That's a Soviet-style indoctrination type question. And when the kid gets done with his course, he's going to think he knows how to think critically. And he doesn't know how to think at all. He knows how to be told what to believe. That's not education. That's indoctrination, Soviet style. They tell the kids, we've got evidence from structure. This is called the homology argument. Yes, boys and girls, did you know you've got two bones in your wrist, radius and ulna? Mm -hmm. And did you know the whale has two bones in his flipper? And look at this. They're called radius and ulna. Right there. See? That proves we're related. <laughs> That's what they tell them. Look at this. These homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. Think critically. A seal's flipper and human arm have different functions. What evidence might help show that both structures evolved from a forelimb of a common ancestor? They show the kids the similar structures. This is in every biology book I've seen. This is one of the evidences for evolution. They call it comparative anatomy. It says comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. The commonalities suggest that these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. This is a lie. They probably have a common designer. You know, maybe the same guy designed them all. But every textbook around the world, I've got books from Latvia and Mexico and Russia, they're all teaching the same thing, folks. And it's silly. By the way, those bones develop from different genes on the chromosomes of these different animals. They're not homologous. Similar design might prove the same designer made them. Did you know the lug nuts from a Pontiac will fit on a Chevy? You can go outside and try it. It'll work. <laughs> that proves they both evolved from a Honda 14 million years ago. <laughs> now look, it's a fact. It's a good observation when they say many animals have a similar forelimb structure. That is a good observation. I agree. Then they say, they must have had a common ancestor. Oh, I disagree. This helps prove we all came from a rock. Oh, jump, frog, jump. Then they say, we've got evidence from development. This one makes me angry, so I'm going to stay calm. We're going to do this in just a few more minutes, and then we're going to quit. Take a break. This book says, the similarity between early stages and development helped convince Darwin that all forms of life shared common ancestors. Darwin considered this by far the strongest piece of facts in favor of his theory. Haeckel called it the biogenetic law. A guy named Ernst Haeckel made up the idea that all the embryos of different animals develop through the same stages, fish, amphibian, reptile, mammal. He called it the biogenetic law. This textbook says, the presence of fish-like structures in the embryos of different species shows that these animals have evolved from fish and share the basic pattern of fish development. Does the human embryo have gills like a fish? That's what the textbook says. This is a lie. Those are not gills. Those little folds of skin develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. They never have anything to do with breathing. I've seen people that have five or six chins and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one. <laughs> Ernst Haeckel, the German professor from Jena University, made up this entire dumb idea in 1869. Darwin's book came out in 1859. The next year it was translated to German. Haeckel read the book and said, wow, what a great theory. If only we had some evidence. Nine years later, they still had no evidence, so Haeckel decided to make some. He was an embryology professor. He's taught how embryos develop, so he took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo and changed them, made them look just alike, and said, see, this proves we have a common ancestor with dogs. Well, nobody ca caught on or stopped him, so he did a bunch more. He took drawings of all kinds of different animals and faked them, and he made them all look very, very similar. Haeckel made giant posters of his fake drawings and traveled all over Germany and told everybody, you ought to believe this new theory because we've got the proof right here. After all, he's a, he's a professor of embryology. He wouldn't lie, would he? And how many folks back then had microscopes to check him out? We're talking creatures about this big, you know. 
Haeckel just about single-handedly converted the Germans to believing in evolution. Which led to the obvious conclusion, hey, if evolution is true, then maybe one race has evolved farther than the rest. I wonder who it is. Must be the Germans. We'll see where that led in tape five. On top are Haeckel's fake drawings. Underneath are actual photographs of what he claimed he was drawing a picture of. Haeckel lied deliberately. His own university held a trial and convicted him in 1875. He said, I should feel utterly condemned, except uh, hundreds of biologists lie under the same charge. Everybody else lies, so it's okay for me to lie too. Haeckel's biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail, folks. It's not true. It never was true. Proven wrong, 1875. It's not true. He was convicted of fraud. His own university held a trial and convicted one of their own professors of lying. But his drawings are still used in textbooks in your county tonight. Proven wrong 125 years ago. Darwin wrote his book, 1859. He predicted evidence would be found. 1869, Haeckel faked the drawings. 1875, he was convicted of lying. But his drawings are still in textbooks 125 years later. Now, I know it takes a while for textbooks to get up to date. But I think 125 years is long enough. They're still teaching this stuff in textbooks all over the world. This one says, if proof of evolution from a common ancestor because of the gill slits on the human, this is simply a lie. Here's a year 2000 textbook teaching it. 2001 junior high textbook. The similarities provide evidence that these three animals evolved from a common ancestor. What similarities, teacher? Don't you see they have tiny gill slits? Folks, this is a lie. Why are we still teaching this to our kids? There's a 2000 college textbook. Similar, humans and fish embryos resemble each other because humans and fish share a common ancestor. This college textbook says the human has gill pouches. Biology, arms in camp, one of the worst ones there is, shows a five to six week embryo, but then it says by seven months, the fetus looks like a tiny normal baby, but it's not. It's not a baby at seven months. Hello? It's a human at conception. Every doctor knows that. 34% of babies born at five and a half months are going to survive. Maybe you heard about the lady that had surgery on her baby before it was born. They cut the mother open, cut the uterus open, and there's the baby holding the doctor's finger five months along. Let's see. The angel of the Lord said, Behold, thou art with fetus. No, I believe he said you are with child, didn't he? Hey, did you know it's a child before it's born? God knows that. Get more on the embryology lie on the book Icons of Evolution. Why do they keep this in the textbooks? That's the only way to justify abortion. They want you to think it's just a fish or an amphibian. You're not killing a child, you're killing a fish. That's why it's in the books, folks. Somebody wants to reduce the population of our planet. His name is Satan cover more on that on video number five about the effects of this evolution teaching. Uh, I live in Pensacola. <clears throat> you might have heard of my town. We've had two doctors killed that were doing abortions. Several clinics blown up or burned down. I didn't shoot any doctors and I didn't blow up any clinics, okay? And I don't think Jesus would do it that way either. He grew up under Roman control, you know. He didn't go around blowing up tanks and burning down bridges. But the doctors were murderers, plain and simple. When the first doctor got shot, I happened to be preaching in Fort Lauderdale. The next day I was flying home, anyway, and right in front of me on the airplane were two ladies, I'm sorry, two women, from NOW, National Organization for Wild Women. <laughs> they were upset, boy, they were going to go march around Pensacola, you know, protesting this doctor getting shot, Dr. Gunn. As we got off the plane, I noticed on their shirt they had in huge block letters, CHOICE ABOVE ALL. So, being my mild-mannered self, I said, excuse me, ma'am, what does this mean, CHOICE ABOVE ALL? She said, we believe a woman ought to have a right to choose. I said, choose what? She said, choose to have an abortion. It's her body, you know. Well, yes, ma'am. If she wants to abort her body, I suppose that's fine. <laughs> but it looks to me like she wants to abort somebody else's body. You know, when you consider half of them are male, it's not her body. Think about it. I said, ma'am, I'm kind of curious about this. I have three kids, one of each. I delivered one of my kids at home. I taught biology and anatomy. I used to raise hamsters. 
I'm kind of familiar with how this works. I said, tell me, why does the woman's right to choice stop at birth? Why don't we let the mother kill the baby after it's born? It'd be a lot safer and simpler. By the way, that's what Peter Singer wants. He's pushing for abortions up till the kid's 28 days old. You can decide if you want to keep it or not. 